Good morning, uh, Joe Winberg, Wilbert Semaphore, and today I'm going to <clears throat> do a world history, it'll be World History 37, uh, before I even practice the piano or do anything else, so it's pretty early, but only, I, I just don't want to get these thoughts out of my mind before I put them down, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk and then go about my daily routine. And so, <clears throat> I moved along, and I think maybe you heard, you know this from the last talking, I moved along to India. And uh, <clears throat> I wanna start out by saying that India is the oldest civilization on the planet. India and the Indian civilization. The oldest on the planet. Older than China, older than Mesopotamia, older than Egypt. The civilization is the oldest. I want to say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, as a civilization, India was <clears throat> moving along, like I said, as a civilization 10,000 years ago, and probably more. I don't have the dates. Uh, you know, there were a lot of dates thrown at me already. But, <clears throat> you know, I know pretty much for sure China didn't really become a civilization. They were still in the late Paleolithic or late Neolithic or whatever um, at 2500 B.C., and, and the other ones, 3000 BC and so on, the uh, Mesopotamian cultures, the, the Egyptian cultures. So, and the reason why India qualifies for being a civilization many thousands of years before these other countries and cultures is because <clears throat> they had a habit of living together as towns and cities with administration, with um, with a very well-defined culture these many thousands of years ago, although they didn't have writing, which uh, the other ones, you know, around 3,000 and some more, they started with the hier hieroglyphics and so on. But uh, India <clears throat> had to wait for Sanskrit to come in, and that probably didn't get into India until around, say, 2500 BC, 3000 BC, when certain people moved in, <clears throat> probably people from the Indo Aryan language group, and brought them some semblance of writing. And that's where the historians would stick. Uh, a, a shaft of some sort in the ground to say this is where Indian history starts when they have language, when they have writing. They had language, but they didn't have writing. Uh, so, very ancient civilization. <clears throat> and, it, and indeed, that ancient civilization uh, was, was part and parcel of the Indian culture was part and parcel of the Indian daily life. Uh, uh, certainly up until recently, and and like let's say, you know, when they got their independence and thereabouts, some some westernization started taking place and modernization. But they still remain more than any other people you know, adherence to their original cultures that date back many, many, many thousands of years ago. So, if you want to see <clears throat> ancient people uh, living in the ancient ways, I, if you go to India today, you're going to see a lot of that because they still perform much in the way they did 8,000 years ago, 10,000, 5,000, and so on. Now, 
you know, the, uh, the culture was stratified, no doubt about that. I mean, we all know that, you know, the case systems and the untouchables. But, uh, and there were a lot of uh, many states, small states, not a lot, you know, at any given time, there was a five, six, who knows, but there were, it wasn't just one big, big king, there were a couple. And these kings, <clears throat> they owned everything. They owned the trees, they owned the ground, the grass, the air, everything, and they were considered gods. And they had, they had a, certain duties besides the fact that they owned everything and they could do whatever they want pretty much, but they did have duties and they carried out their rituals and so on. But uh, I want to get right to the topic that has been uh, pretty much preeminent in the last four or five talks, and that's, that's about reforestation. Well, <clears throat> I don't see anything yet to indicate that <clears throat> they were big time deforestation, that there was any of that going on big time. Now, there had to be some because they had to plant crops, which they did plant plenty of crops. But they also were living in an extremely fertile area. The, um, one of the most fertile valleys on the planet, the Indus, the Indus Ganjatic, Ganjatic Plain, uh, a strip of the earth, uh, going east and west, and maybe a couple hundred miles uh, north and south. Not, not totally to each coast, but, you know, from, from that general area over to the other coast general area. And, and the, uh, <clears throat> they did their planting and what have you. They, they had to take down trees to do the planting. But the point that I'm going to make is that the Indian culture had a bureaucrat and, a minister, and an administrator and an overseer and this and that for every little thing you can imagine. And one of the trades, not, not an official administrator, but one of the trades was a, was a forester. And as a forester, he would be uh, told to go and get a tree. Now, that tree belonged to the king. So before he could go and cut the tree down, he had to have the permission, and then he also had to do certain rituals to satisfy the spirit that lived in the tree, to make sure it was okay with him to cut it down. So they, they didn't go about clearing the forests aggressively, like all the other countries that I've mentioned so far. Did the original forests get damaged yes there's no doubt about it a we hear the wildlife shows on tv all the time talking about the degradation of the uh, the forests and and the wildlife habitat in in india we hear about that there's not enough for the tiger to live and this that and the other thing and the elephant so but what's unusual about this culture is that they seem to have a great rev reverence for nature. So much so that one of their uh, ritual ceremonies was a, a ceremony for reforestation. So, and I don't know if they did that every year or whatever, but they did have a specific ceremony aimed at reforestation. So they were concerned. They understood the connection between the forests and their well-being. And uh, I wanted to point that out because so far I'm not seeing any evidence that they were involved in big time mass clearing of forests. And that, that concept seems to agree with what I know about present day India, they, they're concerned about keeping habitat for wildlife, no doubt about it. Now, um, the, the, one of the earlier uh, sites of habitation 
Hapro, H A P P A R, Hapro, uh, whatever. The uh, a site in Western India. Uh, in the in the bottom reaches of the Indus River, the Haparo or Haparo, whatever you pronounce it, culture. And it, that, it was only recently that the archaeologists <clears throat> uncovered this city. And there's another one up and to the east of it too, Mohan Dojo or something like that. Anyway. These were uh, extremely well-planned and well-made uh, communities, and we're talking 2,000, 2,500 BC, quite quite a ways back there, and they were extremely well built and well designed. The thought is that <clears throat> the people were streaming into India from places like Afghanistan and Iran who had that, basically we would call it uh, uh, architect. They had architectural science already. They had manuscripts written about how to do this. And as an example, the streets were very well lined out in a, in a grid-like pattern. And they had beds, well, so did the Romans, but these beds were built out of stone blocks and they were so well cut that they were waterproof. The water didn't slip through the seams of rock to rock. Very well cut. That would be the floor and the walls. And they had, uh, you know, they had quite an elaborate system or systems of bringing water to the bath and taking it off as effluent. So, and, and you know, it, over the centuries, this all had been buried in sand. So <clears throat> this this area where this knowledge came to them is one of the most important pathways from other parts of the world, the earth, the planet, into India. I mean, it is the, exactly the same pathway that Alexander the Great took with his pe people. And and what's interesting, well, there's a lot of things interesting about that, but uh, Alexander the Great had in his retinue uh, Greeks. Well, he was Greek, right? So Macedonian. But he, he had in that huge army of soldiers and administrators and craftsmen, he had, he had Greeks. And many of the Greeks wound up settling in those parts of India. <clears throat> and so to this day, you do still have Greek as, as part of India. Uh, also, and I'll mention it, it's not pertinent to what I'm talking about, but uh, if you read a lot of Kipling, you know, he, he, had, he has his spies going up that area, up in that region, in and out. Russian spies, the Indian spies, the British spies, all going up and down. It's very interesting. <clears throat> but uh, you've heard of the term the Punjab. Uh, this is in that general area. The uh, Kurdish Kush Mountains, the Himalayas are basically broken up into three major mountain systems. One is the Greater Himalayan that we all are aware of, another the Kurdish Kush, the Kush something, and then there's one other I can't think of it right now. But what I'm trying to get at is that basically, not too much of the Greater Himalayans are in India. They just come down and border it and touch it. The, uh, the Himalayas are to a great extent more in Nepal. Uh, Bruno, or whatever that name of that country is, to the east, Assam. And then you get out uh, to the west, and you're in the uh, the mountain range that K2 is. K2 is a fam famous mountain because it's the second highest after Everest. I think that's actually in Afghanistan. So a great deal of the Himalayas are really uh, over there in uh, Afghanistan.
Afghanistan and northern Pakistan. <clears throat> this is not really history. This is just giving you the lay of the land. And between the Himalayas and India proper is Nepal, which is a narrow country, but extending east and west pretty, pretty, a great deal. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the Kipling stories they mention a lot. A place called Simla, which is also gets close up into. <clears throat> perhaps being near these, uh, these mountain ranges. As a matter of fact, the, the government, the British government, and would be situated in Delhi or New Delhi during the, uh, <clears throat> the cooler months, and then when the hot months came along, they, were, they would all go up to Simla, which was higher in the mountains, high elevation, which would be cooler in the summertime. Now, I looked at that in the map. It's not that close from Delhi or New Delhi, which are both very close, to uh, Simla. But that's what they did. And, and Kipling talks about that a lot in his novels and his stories. And he makes it out to be a very <clears throat> pleasant lifestyle for the colonialists. They're... Uh, country cottages with great porches around them, you know, and an army of servants to take care of them. Of course, it would be very nice. But uh, the, the going back to ancient India, a very stratified society, extremely stratified, and you were born into a certain class, and that's it. It's over, you know. There's nothing else for you. <coughs> now, they talk about this and they break it up to Vedic, pre-Vedic times, pre-Brahman uh, pre times. So what is happening in pre-Sanskrit, pre what's happening is that there's a culture and they refer to it as the Vedic culture. And I think that's basically because of the, <clears throat> the looking backwards from the time when they were writing in Sanskrit that they they were aware that there was this previous culture before Hinduism and it was this Ved, Vedic culture that didn't have writing but the the Hindu slash Sanskrit was able to give them a look back or give historians a look back into what was going on in the Vedic times well what was going on was very similar to what went on forever going forward through the Hindu, Hindu portion, the Brahmin portion, the which which oh yeah, and Buddhist portion that the Buddhists came into this too. So and that you know, that whole stream continues today. You know, so if you're back there you're going to be brushing up against an ancient culture way back to the Vedic times, all through Hindu, all through Brahmanism, all through Buddhism, all this stuff, okay? Now, the only nod the Indian culture of today gives to the rest of the world is they've modernized, you know, they have technology, and they and and they live in in apartment buildings, and they have motor cars on the street, but their their spirituality is still the ancient spirituality of the Hindus, the Brahms, the the uh, the Buddhists, and 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 certain others. Now, the, in the Punjab, they probably would refute what I'm saying and say that they're more perhaps tied or connected to Muslims and Moslems. And uh, that, be that as it may, of course, they're right up against Pakistan over there. So that's true, too. So you, and, and, and embedded in all of India, there are Muslims and Muslim communities with their mosques and so on. So basically, it is 
a conglomeration of all the ancient cultures and a couple of newer ones like the Muslims, or the Muslims, or the Islamic. A little bit of the uh, the West stayed over after the granting of independence in 1948. Uh, but uh, like I say, their, their spirituality, their mental outlooks, still pretty much the same as they were 5000 BC. And to me, uh, you know, it's got to be shocking to be in that country if you're coming from the West, today's West. Because uh, they can't be, we can't imagine what it is to be living. And we, we believe there's a spirit in a tree, you know. We can't, but we, it just doesn't make any sense to us. And they've, their outlook on life is still very connected to nature and what nature means to the rest of the world and how nature keeps us, keeps us going forward. But uh, their, their, their culture today is, is quite extremely interesting I have to say very colorful very colorful they, they had one of their trades back in the ancient times was to be a, a a garlander which means which meant and still means that you would create garlands out of flowers and you would you would decorate all over the town you would decorate people with garlands of multicolored flowers multi with scents uh, you know, wonderful perfumes. And, and that was a trade, just like the forester was a trade, just like a, a, uh, a, 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 herd, a herder of, say, uh, cattle and sheep and goats was a trade. Carpenter was a trade. They had all these trades, and all of them had their rules. All of them were under the control of a top guy in that, particular trade, and they were all under the, the uh, supervision of the state and the state's administrators, and once again, everybody and everything reporting to the king. The king was the, just the top most official in any of these states in India, and although they could be referred to as states, their culture was essentially the same. So that you could go anywhere all over India and you wouldn't feel like an outcast because they were still doing culturally what you were familiar with from wherever you came within India. So, and, and over the years, this is going to be another one of these places where <clears throat> I am personally familiar with the names of places in India that were common in the 19th century. Not common in ancient times, because they weren't. The, uh, the West would take those common name places and anglicize them. So uh, we, uh, bomb, what is it, Manas Mana or something. But it, take, for example, the case of Bombay. I don't call it Bombay anymore. I think it's Mombasa. I'm not sure there either, but it just, you know, I'm going to have that problem when I'm reading about India. What am I, where, what are, where and what am I really talking about with this name? So, in, in ancient India, they, their daily lives were <clears throat> extremely predictable filled with ritual, <clears throat> filled with ceremony. And, and, and no way out of whatever life you were born into. No way out, you know. The, uh, we would be, <clears throat> we would be, in a, in, in a way, uh, we would disapprove of that sort of culture where you were tied into being uh, a, a particular type of person to, uh, to make your living. 
if you if you were a carpenter, that's what you were going to be for the rest of your life. We would be, <clears throat> we would find that un, unacceptable. We have what they call social mobility. <clears throat> and I won't get into the pros and cons of social mobility, uh, a current day style, but uh, they didn't have any social mobility. They, uh, but they did have a lot of remarkable ways of prosecuting a life. And the, uh, the uh, one thing, and I'll, I'm going to stop after this one thing, is that in the pre-Hindu state, that we're going back, once again, as I said, to the Vedic times, pre-Hindu and pre-Brahmin, women had a great deal of social status. They were able to be top administrators. They, they were allowed to be part of the warrior class. I believe, and this is true, I believe as, uh, you know, I read this, that as women, they were allowed to be military types, particularly to uh, <clears throat> guard over the the harems of the the princes and the uh, the king, they were they were given military <clears throat> rights to, to act as, as a military as group military a smallish army with a specific pur purpose. But the point is, they were highly esteemed in that very early, early, early Indian culture. But then as time went on, that esteem was taken away from them until they, the whole esteem for women went down the tubes. And <clears throat> you come up with the, the purda, the whatever the word is, B-U-R-D-U-H or something, where not only did they need to cover themselves so that that you wouldn't see any of their flesh out in public, but even inside their houses, their homes, the sections were walled off, and the women would be behind the purda, whatever. So it's obvious to me, although I haven't read it particularly, that at some point in time, back many thousands of years, the men, maybe they felt threatened by the women, whatever, but certainly these, these newer laws and newer stratifications weren't created by women. They were created by men. And why? Probably because they felt threatened or probably because they wanted the women to do their work for them or something. Or probably or because they were jealous. Who knows? But that was taken away from them, their, their high esteem. Now, they do have it back because we know of many women political leaders in the more contemporary eras. We know great uh, scholars, artists, uh, writers, all women. And so uh, gradually, uh, in the higher strata of society, the women have, have come back. But in, in the lower strata, you know, it's still pretty much, you know, women, you know, kind of stay out of sight. And uh, don't be sh going around showing too much, uh, too much skin. We, uh, we prefer to keep you under the burka, or whatever that's called, uh, behind the perda. So, uh, I think I'll cut it short there. Uh, India, the India's going to be a big, long trip. I know that. It's big. It's big. Very big. Plus, uh, you know, the... Uh, its arms were reached out via trade. I mean, they, they've been trading because of their long, long, long sea coasts and their somewhat, uh, uh, you know, the, the access they had to the Silk Road and the caravans that would be going over the top of India, coming from the west, going to the east, but over the top, and all along the sea coasts. 
using the monsoons as the driving force. So their, their tentacles were way out, the Indian tentacles. And uh, it's, you know, a person like myself has no idea, no idea of the implications of the Indian culture on at least a quarter of the earth and its influences on a quarter of the earth and then its minor influence on the, on the rest of world history, particularly from its uh, philosophies and, and things like that, that, that make people think and, and uh, religions, East and West, India, Falcom, a, uh, a point where <clears throat> many of these things evolved. And, and, and these, these years, quantities of years that I'm talking about are minimal, really, when you think of it, because I've talked before that the, uh, the migrations of humans you know, we're talking 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 years. So just to say that India is the oldest civilization, and we're talking 10,000, maybe 14,000 years, it's just a drop in the bucket. And what we must conclude is that in India, there were many more earlier people living more like hunter-gatherers, more like very, very uh, uh, basic agriculturalists, not living in city towns yet, okay? All over India. And I'm quite sure that even to this day, in the heart of uh, southern India, there's uh, <clears throat> populations that uh, are very ancient. And they, they, wherever they came from, they're still like that today. Uh, so a lot of old in India. There's a lot of old in India. And, um, and with that, I think I'll say enough about India. And I'll try to get in a few moments of practice on the piano. Uh, I put one up yesterday, one up over the evening. And it's already one view. And whoever viewed it, Gave it a like. Can you imagine that? I think it's the one that's called Rhapsody on a Long Shot. I put it up over the evening. Okay, folks. Thanks for listening. Go to the library and get out some books on India. Okay? And follow along. Talk to you. Bye.